When you think of iconic American passenger locomotives, a few come to mind. Classic F units, F40s, and maybe even P42s, but there's one iconic locomotive that might not come to mind as often. Like the towering landmark buildings of our great cities, the GG1 itself is a landmark. A familiar, streamlined symbol of excellence with a champion's record of service that will endure unequaled for a long, long time. This is a story of classic Tuscan red paint schemes and boat horns. If you haven't guessed by now, today we'll be diving into the history of America's most iconic electric locomotive, the Pennsylvania Railroad Class GG1. Wow, it's already been a year since the last episode of Retired Amtrak Power, and it seems that Amtrak Guy 365 is done with engines of Amtrak. During that time that he was still making videos, I stopped with Retired Amtrak Power, as he had the concept for the series before me. Yeah, I know, at this point my videos are basically just the great value version of his, but in the beginning I thought that my series would be different from his, because his was doing Amtrak's earlier locomotives, and I was doing more stuff from the 90s and on. I think I had some other excuse too, but it was also pretty invalid. This series is basically a carbon copy. At this point, that's completely out the window, and the only reason why I continued this series was because I had footage of the F-59 PHIs and I thought I would be able to make a decent video about them. Anyways, now I think it's okay to continue this series because it seems that Amtrak Guy 365 is working on different stuff now. For the most part, there's an Engines of Amtrak episode on most of Amtrak's engines, except for a few that are either not very important to the history of the railroad or were inherited from railroads that came before Amtrak. Anyways, that's where our story begins, way before Amtrak. We're gonna go all the way back to the mid 1800s hundreds when the Pennsylvania Railroad was working on building a railroad between New York City and Washington DC. This line, now known as the Northeast Corridor, was originally built as a bunch of shorter lines, all of which were connected together at the ends. Rail lines were built between 1834 and 1907, starting up north in New York and ending south of there in Washington DC. Service began with a bunch of different shorter distance routes that would often go less than 100 miles, but soon enough the PRR was using steam powered trains across the entire line between New York and Washington. This PRR line connected to the New Haven line that connected north and New York. And speaking of that line, in 1902, 17 people died in a train due to smoke inhalation from a steam locomotive in the Park Avenue Tunnel in New York. In reaction to this accident, the New Haven Railroad announced that they would electrify the main line between New York and Stamford, Connecticut. Not wanting to fall behind on the times, the PRR quickly made plans to electrify its own line between New York and Washington, which was also to be done in segments. This work was done between 1907 and 1933. During this time that parts of the line were being electrified, the PRR began running electric trains in the small parts of the line that were already complete. Service began in the 1910s with the FF1 locomotives built by the Altoona Works. Within a few years, these units were found to be too slow for passenger service, and soon enough they were phased into electrified freight service. After the failure of the FF1s, the PRR used Class P5s and eventually upgraded the cabs for better visibility and called them P5As. These P5As were better than the FF1s, but they didn't do well at higher speeds, so once again, it was back to the drawing board. In 1933, the PRR asked General Electric and Westinghouse to design an electric locomotive based on the New Haven's EP3. No, not that EP3, the electric locomotive. Why are there always Honda references in my videos? Anyways, the General Electric and Westinghouse set out to build a locomotive with a streamlined design, a center cab, and it would have a top speed of at least 100 miles per hour. Both companies delivered their prototypes in August of 1934 with Westinghouse submitting the R1 and General Electric submitting the GG1. The R1 was basically a longer and more powerful P5A, but the GG1 was completely new. Both locomotives were tested for 10 weeks on a test track in Claymont, Delaware, and the R1 was found to not handle curves and switches as well as the GG1. As you would expect, the PRR ordered 57 more of these GG1s, with some being built by GE in Erie, Pennsylvania, and the rest being built by the PRR in Altoona, Pennsylvania. These locomotives had a top speed of 100 miles per hour, a tractive effort of 165 pound-feet, and 4,620 horsepower. The classification was a strange one, using PRR's ways of denoting axle count. The two G's in the name represented the two 460 arrangements, as on the PRR, 460 was designated as a class G. The one represented the ratio of powered to unpowered axles for each truck. There were three powered and two unpowered axles on each side of the locomotive, so three minus two is one, making the weird PRR classification of these locomotives GG1. Some GG1s were painted in Brunswick green, and some were painted in Tuscan red. The first GG1 was delivered just in time for when the line was fully electrified between New York and DC on January 28, 1935. On this day, GG1 number 4800 hauled the first electric train between these two cities. In the following years, the GG1s would prove themselves to be extremely reliable locomotives, and the PRR eventually ordered an additional 81 locomotives to be built at the Altoona Works between 1937 and 1943. By the time of the last of these 81 locomotives were delivered, the PRR had a total 
total of 139 GG1s on their fleet. They even hauled Franklin D. Roosevelt's funeral train in 1945. As the 1950s set in, more people started to drive and fly everywhere, and passenger rail began its decline. 57 GG1s were re-geared for freight service, leaving 82 engines for passenger service. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, the state of passenger rail continued to get worse and worse, leading to the infamous merger of the New York Central, Pennsylvania Railroad, and New Haven Railroad in 1968, forming the Penn Central. One of the greatest railroads in history, 50 years of great railroading, the Penn Central. Penn Central, baby, you can count on us. Penn Central! Yeah, there we go, yeah! Many GG1s were repainted into PC paint, and they continued on in passenger service with declining ridership until 1971 when President Richard Nixon signed the Rail Passenger Service Act into law. This created Amtrak, a government-ran for-profit railroad that took over the unprofitable services that were previously run by private railroads such as the Penn Central. Amtrak purchased 30 of the Penn Central's GG1s and leased 11. They were renumbered to 900 through 929, and the leased units were eventually renumbered to 4930 through 4939 due to number conflicts. The remaining GG1s remained in service with Penn Central and eventually Conrail when Penn Central went bankrupt. Amtrak's GG1s soldiered on through the 70s, but their replacement was coming in the form of the GE E60, another giant GE electric. Amtrak wanted to replace the GG1s, not because they were becoming more unreliable with age, but only because they were becoming outdated and slow. Luckily for the GG1s, but not so much Amtrak, the E60s were plagued with issues, such as derailing at higher speeds, and Amtrak wanted faster engines to replace the GG1s. The E60s were placed in slower, long-distance service, and Amtrak continued to search for a replacement for the GG1s, which were still extremely reliable, despite the fact that they were all approaching 50 years old. After testing a few European engines, Amtrak decided to order EMD AEM7s, which were found to be almost as reliable as the GG1s, while being lighter and capable of higher speeds without derailing. As the AEM7s were delivered, GG1s were slowly phased out of service, and the last GG1 made its final stand on April 26, 1980. After that, 10 of Amtrak's GG1s were sold to museums, and the rest were scrapped. The final GG1s left in service anywhere were the 13 X conrail GG1s that were still running in New Jersey Transit Service. Eventually, even these 13 were retired three years later, and four of these were sold to museums. Additionally, two more were sold to museums earlier than the 80s, as Conrail didn't place all GG1s into New Jersey Transit Service, just a few. This made a grand total of 16 preserved GG1s and 123 scrapped ones. Of these preserved ones, six sport PRR Brunswick green paint, four sport PRR Tuscan red paint, three sport Amtrak black paint, two sport Conrail black paint, and one sports Penn Central black paint. Most of these remaining units are in varying conditions, with many being basically abandoned, and some being in really nice shape, such as 4935, which is stored at the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania in Strasburg. Over the years, there has been talk of restoring a GG1 to running condition, but the only GG1 that would even be considered for restoration is 4935. Most GG1s had their transformers removed, and many of the traction motors shorted out years ago. Most others are completely deteriorated and basically broken beyond repair. Many doubt that a GG1 will ever run again, but if one ever does, it will likely be 4935. The legacy of the GG1s will always be an interesting one. They survived 50 years of high-speed service and one of the biggest bankruptcies of all time. If it wasn't for being phased out due to being outdated, I wouldn't be surprised if they lasted another 20 years, as with proper consistent maintenance, the GG1s were the most reliable electric locomotive of all time. Hey guys, Sam here. As you can see, I'm starting to change the content that I post on my channel. After the success of High Speed Rail Week, it's become increasingly clear what content my viewers want to see, so that means I'm going to start making a lot more narrated videos. This doesn't mean that regular railfang videos are going away, but they won't be uploaded nearly as often as they were in the past. Other than that, there's not much more to say than thanks for watching.